Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's presentation, Freemasonry and the Druids, comes in two parts. The first part is a short passage by Brother Stanley K. Sproul, written in 1983, which gives a brief background to, to Druidism and its possible relationship to Freemasonry. The second section is a little bit longer. It's a text called Freemasonry and the Druids by W. Winwood Reed, and I'll introduce Winwood Reed a little bit further on. I hope you enjoy the video. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. Druidism and Freemasonry The Druids were priests of ancient Celtic Britain and Gaul. They constituted a priestly upper class in command of a highly ritualistic religion, which apparently worshipped ancient nature gods. Highly educated themselves, they directed the education of the youth and judged without appeal all controversies. They paid no taxes. If anyone disagreed with their decisions, he was excommunicated and thereafter was refused admittance to all their religious services and barred from all communication with his relatives, friends and countrymen. They never committed to paper any of their rituals or ceremonies. Consequently, what is known comes secondhand from the Romans, notably Julius Caesar. Rome was well aware of the Druids as they formed its chief adversaries in the lands held by the Celtic tribes. At the head of their organization was the Arch Druid. He was supported by Arch Flamens and Flamens. They had three orders, the Vates or Bards, the Prophets and the Druids. Before a candidate was accepted into the first degree, he had to undergo careful preparation which could in some cases last for up to 20 years. In the first degree or order, he was taught fortitude, which they considered one of the leading traits of perfection. In the second order, the candidate underwent lustration, after which he was instructed in the morality of the order. Few passed beyond the second order. Only those of rank were admitted to the third order of Druids where the aspirant passed through arduous ceremonies of purification. In the third order, the candidate was secluded in solitude for a period of nine months. This time was devoted to reflection and to a study of the sciences. In this order, as in the first, he was submitted to a symbolic death and resurrection. At the end, he was actually set adrift in a small boat into the open sea and was left to his own devices to reach the opposite shore. If he succeeded, he passed. If he refused any of the tests, he was rejected forever, even when some of the trials could, and did, cost the candidate his life. This final sacred ceremony was followed by an oath of secrecy, the violation of which could only be expiated by death. Druids believed in the existence of one supreme being, a future state of reward or punishment, the immortality of the soul, and a metempsychosis, or a conversion into various types of animals. These doctrines were communicated by symbolism. Some of our ancient brethren, such as Preston and Hutchinson, have suggested that Freemasonry was derived from the Druids. The theory is advanced that the Phoenicians, in their journeys around Cornwall and Wales, introduced their religion into the area. This cannot be supported by any proof, since what is known of the religion of the Phoenicians bears little resemblance to the fierce and sanguinary superstition of the Druids with its human sacrifices. William Winwood Reed 
was a British historian, explorer and philosopher. He lived from 1838 to 1876. He is best known for his book The Martyrdom of Man, published in 1872. His short work Freemasonry and the Druids was written in the last few years of his life. And again, for reasons of brevity, I have reducted some portions of this work. The brethren, seated in a circle, one of the masters arises and advances to the midst. He relates to them a tradition of the origin of their craft. After the sun had descended down the seventh age from Adam before the flood of Noah, there was born unto Methusael, the son of Mehujael, a man called Lamech, who took unto himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, of the other, Zillah. Now Ada, his first wife, bare two sons, the one named Jabal and the other Jubal. Jabal was the inventor of geometry and the first who built houses of stone and timber, and Jubal was the inventor of music and harmony. Zillah, his second wife, bare Tubalcane, the instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and a daughter called Neymar, who was the founder of the weaver's craft. All these had knowledge from above, but the Almighty would take vengeance for sin, either by fire or by water. So great was the wickedness of the world. So they reasoned among themselves how they might preserve the knowledge of the sciences which they had found. And Jabal said that there were two different kinds of stone of such virtue that one would not burn and the other would not sink. The one called marble and the other latries. They then agreed to write all the science that they had found upon these stones. After the destruction of the world, these two pillars were discovered by Hermes, the son of Shem. Then the craft of masonry began to flourish, and Nimrod was one of the earliest patrons of the art. Abraham, the son of Jira, was skilled in the seven sciences and taught the Egyptians the science of grammar. Euclid was his pupil and instructed them in the art of making mighty walls and ditches to preserve their houses from the inundations of the Nile and by geometry measured out the land and divided it into partitions so that each man might ascertain his own property. And he it was who gave masonry the name of geometry. In his days it came to pass that the sovereign and lords of the realm had gotten many sons unlawfully by other men's wives, insomuch that the land was grievously burdened with them. A council was called, but no reasonable remedy was proposed. The king then ordered a proclamation to be made throughout his realms that high rewards would be given to any man who would devise a proper method for maintaining his children. Euclid dispelled the difficulty. He thus addressed the king. My noble sovereign, if I may have order and government of these lords' sons, I will teach them the seven liberal sciences, whereby they may live honestly like gentlemen, provided that you will grant me power over them by virtue of your royal commission. This request was immediately complied with and Euclid established her lodge of masons. This tale is curious as being the earliest account of an educational institution. There are various traditions of minor interests relating to the patriarchal ages and to the wanderings of the Israelites in the wilderness. The Freemasons claim descent from that body of builders who, some from Phoenicia and some from India, came to Jerusalem to erect the Temple of Solomon. They also assert that these Masons were governed by the same laws and united by the same ties as those of the modern order. However, the real secrets of Freemasonry, its origin and purport, remain as yet an enigma and will probably ever remain so. There are some authors who have fixed the source of this sacred and mysterious fountain within the oaken groves of the extinguished order of the Druids. 
who assert that when Druidism was prescribed, its priests adopt various disguises and carried their learning into various professions. Some became schoolmasters and taught science to the youth of Britain, as they had once done in the forest seminaries of Mona. Some fortune tellers, the parents of the tribes of gypsies who still retain a kind of brotherhood united by oaths and secret signs, and who at one time possessed so strange an ascendancy over the minds of the vulgar. And others who formed themselves into a community resembling, if not in their power, at least in their unanimity, that ancient body of priests who had once been the sovereigns of Britain. At first I was inclined to believe that such was really the case, and that Freemasonry was no more than a reproduction of Druidism in the Middle Ages. On searching for materials, I met with evidence in Limine, which tended to confirm me in this conviction. There was a manuscript discovered in the Bodleian Library at Oxford in 1696, which was supposed to have been written about the year 1436. It purports to be an examination of one of the Brotherhood by King Henry VI, and is allowed by all Masonic writers to be genuine. Its title is as follows. Certain questions with answers to the same concerning the mystery of Masonry, written by King Henry VI and faithfully copied by me, John Leyland, antiquarian by command of His Highness. I will give an extract modernizing the English of the original, which, though quaint, would be unintelligible to all but antiquaries. What mote it be? It is the knowledge of nature and the power of its various operations, particularly the skill of reckoning, of weights and measures, of constructing buildings and dwellings of all kinds, and the true manner of forming all things for the use of man. Where did it begin? It began with the first men of the East, who were before the first men of the West, and, coming with it, it hath brought all comforts to the wild and comfortless. Who brought it to the West? The Phoenicians, who, being great merchants, came first from the East into Phoenicia for the convenience of commerce, both East and West by the Red and Mediterranean Seas. How came it into England? Pythagoras, a Grecian, travelled to acquire knowledge in Egypt and in Syria and in every other land where the Phoenicians had planted masonry, and, gaining admittance into all lodges of masons, he learned much, and returned and dwelt in Grecia Magna, growing and becoming mighty wise and greatly renowned. Here he formed a great lodge at Crotona and made many masons, some of whom travelled into France, and there made many more. From whence, in the process of time, the art passed into England. This, I need not remind the reader, is a story very similar to those current respecting the first planting of Druidism in Britain. I also discovered, as I thought, a key to the tradition of Hiram Abiff, that it was simply the story of Osiris, killed by Typhon the evil spirit, buried in a coffin and found by Isis so corrupted by modern masons. In a figure painted on a mummy at the Austin Friars of La Place de Victors, representing the death and resurrection of Osiris, is seen an exact model of the position of the master mason as he raises Hiram. Jubila, jubilo, jubilum are merely variations from the Latin word jubio, I command. A more satisfactory proof of the truth of this statement is contained in an astronomical notion of the Hindus, whose Krishna is the same as the Osiris of the Egyptians. The Deccans, or Elohim, are the gods of whom it is said the Almighty created the universe. They arranged the order of the zodiac. The Elohim of the summer were gods of a benevolent disposition. They made the days long and loaded the sun's head with topaz. While the three wretches that presided in the winter, at the extreme end of the year, hid in the realms below, were, with the constellation to which they belonged,
cut off from the rest of the zodiac, and as they were missing, they were consequently accused of bringing Krishna into those troubles which at last ended in his death. Even allowing these premises to be true, it does not necessarily follow that the traditional account of the building of King Solomon's temple by Masons was also allegorical. And indeed, there is so much that is purely Hebrew in ceremonial masonry that one is almost forced to believe that the Freemasons of the present day are really descended from a body of architects who, like the Dionysiacs of Asia Minor, were united into a fraternal association and who erected the Temple of Solomon. In these ceremonies, however, and in their emblems, there is much that is also Druidic. And if Freemasonry did not emanate from Druidism, there can be no doubt that it sprang from the same origin. I will trace out the affinity between the Masonic Order of the Present and the Druid Order of the Past. It shall be for the reader to decide whether these Masonic usages are vestiges of Druidism or mere points of family resemblance. The initiations of Masons are so similar to those of the Druids that any Mason reading my article upon the subject must have been struck by the resemblance. The Ovade wore a gold chain around his neck, and the Apprentice, when initiated, has a silk cord, in Masonic parlance a cable toe, suspended from his throat. Like the Ovade, the Apprentice is blindfolded, and as the former was led through the mazes of a labyrinth, the latter is led backwards and forwards in various directions. Thunder and lightning were counterfeited in the initiation of a druid, and in that of the royal arch, the companions fire pistols, clash swords, overturn chairs, and roll cannonballs across the floor. The tiler stands at the door with a drawn sword, and tests of fortitude, though less severe than those of former times, are not unknown among Masons. The following arduous trial was used in the female lodges of Paris. A candidate for admission was usually very much excited. During a part of the ceremony, she was conducted to an eminence and told to look down at what awaited her if she faltered in her duty. Beneath her appeared a frightful abyss in which a double row of iron spikes was visible. No doubt her mind was in a chaos of fanaticism, for instead of shrinking at the sight, she exclaimed, I can encounter all, and sprang forward. At that moment, a secret spring was touched, and the candidate fell, not on the spikes, but on a green bed in imitation of a verdant plain. She fainted, but was soon recovered by her friends. When the scene having changed, she was reanimated and soothed by the sweet strains of choral music. I have already shown, I trust conclusively, that the Druidic mysteries were founded on those of the Egyptians and were analogous to those of Tyre, Persia and Hindustan, and that their moral doctrines and pristine simplicity of worship were those of the Hebrew patriarchs. It will be easy to show that those of Freemasonry if not a mere perpetuation of the Druidic, were derived from the same foundations and that the secrets of this science and philosophy are hidden to us by the veil of Isis. To the Egyptian candidate on his initiation, the Hierophant displayed the holy volume of hieroglyphics which he then restored to its repository. So, when the eyes of the apprentice are first released from darkness, he beholds the volume of the sacred law. During the Persian initiations, the doctrine was enforced ex cathedra from the desk or pulpit. So the Grand Master sits on a throne before which the candidate kneels, pointing a dagger to his naked left breast and two white wands being crossed above his head. On the seal of the ancient abbey of Aberoath in Scotland, is a representation which bears a curious resemblance to the engraving on a seal used by the priests of Isis, and which Plutarch describes in his essay on Isis and Osiris. 
a man kneeling, his hands bound and a knife at his throat. In all the ancient mysteries, before an aspirant could claim participation in the higher secrets of the institution, he was placed within the pastos or bed or coffin and was subjected to a confinement in darkness for a certain time. This I have described to be practiced by the Druids. In some of their labyrinths discovered in France, the remains of cells have been found, and there was a dark cell of probation recently standing near Maidstone. So, in the initiation of a master mason, the candidate is, in some lodges, buried in a coffin to represent the death of the murdered Hiram Abiff. The grand festival of masonry is on Midsummer Day, which was also the grand festival of the Druids. The processional movements of the masons, as of the Druids, were mostly circular. I have already instanced the symbol by which the Jews expressed the word Jehovah. This letter, Yod, was believed by them to denote the presence of God, especially when conveyed in a circle. Masons also have a word which they are not allowed to pronounce except in the presence of a full lodge, and they pay peculiar reverence to a point within a circle. Some of the Druidic monuments are simple circles with a stone standing in their midst, and the boss in the centre of their circular shields had probably the same signification. The Masonic Lodge, like all pagan temples, is built due east and west. Its form is an oblong square, which the ancients believed to be the shape of the world. In the west are two pillars surmounted by globes. The one on the left is called Boaz and is supposed to represent Osiris or the sun. The other, Jarkon, the emblem of Isis or the moon. The floor is mosaic and the walls are adorned with the various symbols of the craft. The cross is one of the chief emblems in masonry, as it was in Druidism and in all the pagan religions. The tor is a badge in Royal Arch Masonry and almost all the other varieties of the symbol are used in masonry. The key and the cross keys are also mosaic symbols. They are supposed to be astronomical signs of Anubis or the dog star. The ear of corn is a prominent emblem in masonry, proving that the order did not confine their intellects and their labours to the building of houses, but devoted themselves also to agriculture. A sprig of acacia is one of the emblems revered by the masons and answers to the Egyptian lotus, to the myrtle of Eleusis, to the golden branch of Virgil and to the druidic mistletoe. It is curious that Hauser, which Muhammad esteemed an idol, Hauser so honoured in the Arabian works of Gaftan, Koresh, Kenan and Salem, should be simply the acacia. Thence was derived the word Hazar in our language, which was probably at first a religious exclamation like Ehove of the Bacantes. The doctrines of masonry are the most beautiful that it is possible to conceive. They breathe the simplicity of the earliest ages, animated by the love of a martyred god. That word, which the Puritans translated charity, but which is really love. Love is the keystone of the royal arch upon which is supported the entire system of this mystic science. In the lectures of the French lodges, the whole duty of a mason is summed up in this one brief sentence. Love one another, teach one another, help one another. That is all our doctrine, all our science, all our law. Ah, rail against us bigoted and ignorant men, slander us curious and jealous women if you will. Those who obey the precepts of their masters and those who listen to the truths which they inculcate can readily forgive you. It is impossible to be a good mason without being a good man. We have no narrow-minded prejudices. We do not debar from our society this sect or that sect. It is sufficient for us that a man worships God, no matter, no matter under what name or in what manner, and we admit him. Christians, Jews, Mohammedans, Buddhists, 
all are enrolled among us, and it is in the Mason's Lodge alone that they can kneel down together without feeling hatred, without professing contempt against their brother worshippers. For more Masonic podcasts, videos, music, texts and artwork, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook accounts by searching From the Quarries.